Hey, Marcus here, Sword and Sci-Fi Guy. This is kind of a different video format than I usually do. I've got a presentation right here, and that, that, that's what you see behind me. And this is the weapons and tactics for fighting the mythical creatures of ancient Greece and Rome. This is inspired by my general idea that if you had monsters in a fantasy setting, then in that setting they would develop specific weapons and tactics for dealing with those monsters since, you know, they live with them, and humans develop different weapons and tactics for fighting everything that we've fought. And historically, that's predominantly been humans in different levels of armor, so we would have different tactics for fighting against these sorts of monsters. And these are the monsters that I'm going to talk about. Starting off with the Cyclopes. They are quite strong and significantly larger than humans, so they would not be fun to fight at all. In fact, their immense strength would mean that our normal modern armor, even full plate harness, which came about over a thousand years later, would pretty much be useless to even an unarmed Cyclops. And shields would be useless as well, because they could just throw you around, again, with their fists. But this isn't all bad, because that frees up your hands for two-handed weapons, and you would need something that's two-handed and able to deal a lot of damage to even do anything to a monster this size. Now, there's one way that I can think of to exploit one of their main weaknesses, which is the bad depth perception, since, you know, they've got one eye. There's this one piece of art that I can't find for the life of me, even though I remember what it is, but it's like this long spike, but it's one solid color. So when you're looking at it from the front, it just looks like a flat circle, but if you're looking at it from the side and you walk towards it, you know, you'd, you'd impale yourself. And ninjas kind of used a similar trick to blend things in. They had black gloves and their regular black uniform, so when they held their hands in front of them, you couldn't see exactly where their hands were. So if you painted a weapon in one solid color and then wore clothing in that same solid color, and pointed that at a cyclops, then they would probably not be able to figure out where that weapon is in space, so you could use that to exploit them. Next up is the Medusa or Gorgon. You know, it's one person, but yet in D&D stuff, it's a monstrous lineage or whatever. But anyway, snake-haired person who can turn you into stone. How Perseus did this in the legend, you know, just looking at his shield and seeing the reflection, that would be really bad. And the reason is, while you're busy looking at that reflection, the person that you're fighting could, shockingly, fight back. If Medusa had a sword and you're looking like that, you're not really going to be able to defend yourself. So that's out of the question. Now, there were some advanced mirrors during that classical time period. Archimedes made essentially a giant laser for sinking ships with one of those. So if you decided to create some advanced mirror looking at a mirror that you can see, type of goggles or periscope thing that's actually looking in the direction of where you are fighting, then that would be useful. However, that's admittedly some pretty advanced stuff for the classical period, so another option would be to essentially level the playing field. You can't look at Medusa, so make it so that way she can't look at you. You could make it really dark or fill the fighting area with smoke, so that way you're both blind and you're both flailing around. This would make fighting as a team with somebody else difficult, but I'm sure it could work with the right strategy. Although, given that some snakes have essentially predator vision where they can see in infrared, then that might be useless if Medusa can have that too. Up next is the Minotaur, which is really similar to the Cyclops. You know, they're really large, really strong, so a lot of the same things would likely apply. However, in some period artwork, like right here, Minotaurs aren't that much bigger than regular humans. Although I like to think that they would be pretty big and beefy, like in D&D. So one big issue that would arise with that, in addition to the whole they're big and strong thing, is you'd be fighting in a relatively constricted environment, assuming that you're fighting in the labyrinth. That would mean that you couldn't really use two-handed weapons like you would use against the Cyclops. You would be reduced to close-quarters combat. 
or close quarters battle. I mean, the acronym, it, it, it's the same thing. So a short sword that's still long enough to penetrate into them would probably be your go-to. Or maybe even a relatively short spear that you could choke up on in really close quarters and still have some range to defend yourself in long hallways. But an important thing to remember is, even though you would be confined by CQB principles, the Minotaur would be even more confined by those principles because they'd be larger, so the area would essentially be smaller for them. You would need to exploit their disadvantage of not being able to move around as much as you. And that might give somebody an edge. Now the harpy, which is pretty much a person-bird thing. And historically, there have been large birds of this size in New Zealand, and they were called Host's Eagle. And I haven't found any specific instances of how the Maori would fight them. However, I've seen cases mentioned where they would take Maori children. So I assume some fighting happened, and seeing as how they didn't come up with any specialty weapons there, I kind of assumed that a spear worked pretty well. Another thing that could be good is arrows, but not in the traditional sense. There is a way that you can put two strings on a bow and put a little pouch there where you would hold the arrow and just put multiple smaller arrows on there and make it into kind of a shotgun effect. And that would be pretty decent at attempting to control the skies. But one important thing to remember is these harpies can't attack you without getting into attacking range. So again, spears and other weapons would be pretty useful. Now on to the Hydra. Shields are bad for this sort of monster, but not for the same reason that they were for the Cyclops and the Minotaur. The reason shields are bad here is because this monster can attack from literally any angle. So blocking an entire side of your body's worth of line of sight kind of won't be good because they can just go around that shield. However, wearing armor would be good against them, especially armor that has some sort of offensive capability that might make them regret coming at you from a certain angle. You could put some tasteful spikes. No, I'm not talking D&D Battle Rager level spikes, but some spikes that you could use. And the traditional way that Heracles dealt with the regeneration was having one of his buddies burn the severed head stump so that way it couldn't grow back. Now I realize that we don't all have too many friends, so what's something that we could do if we're fighting a Hydra alone? You could easily dual wield a sword and a torch, but that might be kind of cumbersome. You could make a flaming sword, but if that's a traditional steel sword and we don't have magic, which I mean you honestly might in this setting, if you're fighting mythical monsters. However, if you don't, then setting steel on fire would be pretty darn bad because that would ruin the heat treatment. And then you'd have a really fragile sword. But bronze doesn't need a heat treatment. You could easily cast a blade that's kind of more like in a U or V type shape with a hollow middle and then put some sort of torch wick in the middle of there and set that on fire and you would have a fairly functional flaming sword that won't have its heat treatment ruined because bronze. And that would actually be pretty easy to cast with bronze. So that's a weapon that you could set on fire. Up next would be Cerberus and my daughter's a really big fan of Encanto and my favorite thing that's in that movie is they rhyme Cerberus with surface. And it's said that you can scare away wolves by using fire, however I don't think that would really apply to a dog that lives in the underworld. So how you would fight this monster would really depend on its exact size. If it's like this picture, then pretty much any weapons could fight it, because, I mean, that's, like, smaller than a bear. I mean, you might not have the best odds, but any weapon would be fine. However, if it's this big, then I don't think that we really have any weapons that could deal with that in the classical period, and we wouldn't really get any until Samuel Colt and Winchester come up with their weapons. This is the Hecaton Kairos, the 50-headed, 100-handed giant that kind of single-handedly turned the tides of the Titanomachy. And as a weird side note, the Titanomachy, which was the battle between the Titans and the gods, I find it kind of funny that that only lasted 10 years. I mean, all these people are immortal. You'd 
kind of think that they'd have a really long battle. But no. Anyway, with this picture, these are gods right here, and this is the Hecaton Kairas, and gods are giant already, so you're not gonna fight something this big and with this much martial prowess. That just would not be good. Now sirens, depending on their depiction, they're pretty much the same as harpies, you know, bird people. So a lot of the same tactics would apply, you know, they can't really hurt you until they get close enough for you to hurt them, shoot arrows and stuff. However, this would be difficult because you'd be fighting on boats, which you know, they're kinda not the best ideal firing platforms. Or fighting platforms. And if you're anything like Odysseus and his crew, then you'd have to put something in your ear so that way you can't hear their siren song. And this would make battlefield communication quite difficult. So overall, this would be a pretty tricky fight, but I don't know if it would really be an issue because sirens seem content to just sing their song from far away and lure people closer. I haven't really seen them go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody, so I think as long as you just avoid them, you should be fine. This one doesn't exactly count. It's Arachne, you know, she wove really well, annoyed Athena, and then Athena turned her into a giant spider. However, fighting giant spider things. And this wouldn't really be fun at all. However, one interesting thing to note is spiders are kind of hydraulic. They move by pushing fluid from their cephalothorax to their legs, and that allows them to be really quick. However, if you puncture that cephalothorax, then that essentially depressurizes the spider. And it eventually won't be able to move and then won't be able to put up any resistance. But doing that would be kind of difficult, given their thick exoskeleton, and you would need a specialized weapon. I think that the Roman Pilum would be a great model for this. Because it essentially has a triangle-shaped head and then a thinner shaft. And that means that once it penetrates the shield, the thinner shaft doesn't hang up on the shield, so that way it can actually go deeper. And that same thing would apply to giant spiders. You could puncture a hole in them, and then that hole won't be clogged up by the weapon that you're using. So, you know, it can put out that fluid. So using the pillum as intended, you know, as a throwing weapon, or putting it kind of on an angle and using it a bit like a war pick, all of those would be great options. Now the Ladon, the thing that was guarding the golden apples in some of the legends. I think that both of these pictures have really good depictions of how to fight them. You've got spears and you've got arrows. You know, they're pretty small dragons, so you should be able to handle them, but it's nice to have a decent amount of range, especially if they're able to fly. And I'm kind of tired of these massive dragons in like Game of Thrones and whatever. I think we need to bring back some of these small dragons. And now centaurs, they're essentially just a cavalry unit, so countermeasures to cavalry would be pretty well. You know, having spikes driven in the ground so they can't charge, laying down caltrops like Alexander the Great did to deal with offensive cavalry. And you could easily have an advantage by picking the location that you're fighting, because D&D &D had it right, centaurs can't really climb too well. So if you have an elevated location, or maybe some water or something, then you have a pretty good advantage. However, they're historically pretty good archers, so being far away might not exactly be enough. And hopefully you're a pretty good archer too. And lastly, Achilles. I think his mom really failed when she dunked him into the river sticks because she didn't, you know, switch hands and protect the one place that she could. I mean, she had one job, and she didn't exactly succeed at that. However, I think that what Paris did, you know, shooting Achilles with a bow, is a pretty good way to do it, because you can be pretty accurate with bows, so you can hit a small target. And you wouldn't even need that powerful of a bow to just hit one area. But you could also use sabers, and these didn't come until later. However, since they're curved, and many of them have a false edge, you can do some really interesting cuts behind your opponent. And some of the Victorian and Napoleonic era cuts involve cutting the back of the opponent's legs, so 
you could put that into use pretty easily against Achilles. And I did this as a presentation for a different group, so I've got my information here, and feel free to ask any questions that you want in the comments.